Bibles up to Psalm 19. That's where we're going to start this morning, Psalm 19. I have a memory from high school that sticks out in my mind. I went over to a friend's house one night and we were planning to go bowling later that evening. We were waiting for our ride to come and pick us up. And as we were sitting there at his house, he said, I want to ask you a question. I thought it was going to be something about sports or food or girls. Those were common topics of the day. But instead he said, hey, you go to church, don't you? What is the Bible all about? And that question surprised me because we had never really talked about that before. And I didn't really know what to say to him. I think I said something like, well, it's a book about some people who lived a long time ago that had faith in God. And he said, well, who were some of those people? And the thing that I could come up with in that moment was to tell him the story of Job. And I started talking about how he was a really amazing person. And then as we were getting to the best part of the story, the horn honked and our ride had come to pick us up. The Bible is the most amazing story that has ever been told. But what is that story? The Bible is a big book. It's made up of 66 smaller books. It has 1,189 chapters. If you were to read the New Testament, it would take you about 18 hours. So what is the story of the Bible? That's such an important thing for us to think about, not only for ourselves, but also how we communicate that to other people. So I'd like to spend a few moments this morning thinking about the story of the Bible. And I want to start in Psalm 19, beginning in verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. I found a list recently of the most common names that appear in the Bible. The number of times, the frequency in which the name appears. Some of these won't surprise you, but others you may not have realized that they occur this many times. Number five on the list is, well, before we get to the list. (laughs) So what is the story of the Bible? The Bible is all about God. He is the central theme. The from start to finish the Bible is all about God. In looking at the the note the names and the the occurrences of the names. There's some on this list that might surprise you. The first uh, number 5 is Aaron 342 times. Jacob is found 363 times. Moses, 803. Of course, Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and his name comes up again and again. David, 947 times. 
And then top on that list is Jesus, 1,310 times. But do you see something that is missing from the list, the top list of names? The name God is found 3,995 times. If we add Lord into that, it's over 6,000 times. And putting those together, you have 10,700 plus times that the name of God is used. Every page of this book, except for Esther, but from start to finish, all the way through, the story of the Bible is all about God. And we see from the beginning in Genesis, it tells us how God is a creator. Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky, the earth below, it all shows the work of his hands. God is a creator. When he made the world, he didn't just randomly throw together a bunch of molecules. He didn't push dirt over into a big hill and say, Here's where man is going to live. No, he put it together in the most amazing way. In six days, God created the earth, Genesis tells us. He made the land and the seas. He created the sunsets and the sunrise. The vast oceans and the towering mountains. And at the end of all Of his creation, after forming all these things, the Bible tells us that he saw it and it was very good. Genesis 1.26 tells us that God created man in his image. He placed man in a beautiful garden. He gave him dominion and charge over all living things. He told them to be fruitful and multiply, but not just to be in control. But God wanted his, these man and woman to be his image bearers, to display his love, his character, his grace and goodness throughout all the world. God continues to provide for his creation today. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 28 It says that in him we live and move and have our very being. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, Jesus says that God causes the sun to rise, that he sends rain on both good and evil. God is a creator. And we know that about him. That's revealed to us through his word. We come to understand and learn and know who he is. But the Bible, the story of the Bible doesn't just stop with God setting everything up, making all things, and then backing away. We see that God wants to be connected to his creation. He wants to be involved, to have a relationship with his people. And in Genesis 12, we read about a very special man and his family that God would, imble- that God would bless in incredible ways. From the life of Abraham, we see that God is a provider. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, the Lord is speaking to Abraham and it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. He says that he is a, a shield, a source of great Reward. This is said to Abraham after he was told to leave the land where he was living, to go from his father's house to a place that God would show him. This was no small task. Abraham had to travel hundreds of miles to a place that he had never been before, to an area that was already occupied. It would have been dangerous and uncertain. Lots of unknowns. But God had promised to provide for Abraham, to protect him. And he was faithful to those promises. When Abraham traveled down in 
to Egypt because there was a famine in the land. God did not allow Pharaoh to harm him or his wife, Sarah. When the four kings invaded the land from Mesopotamia, they came in to raid the area where Abraham and his family were living. They took Lot and his possessions away with them, but God delivered Abram's family. He allowed him to save his nephew. The Lord richly blessed Abraham with flocks and herds and servants, but it wasn't just material blessings. He gave him a family. He provided a son for him. When Abraham was nearly 100 years old and Sarah was 90, long past the age of being able to have children, God kept his promise. He gave them a son and allowed Isaac to be born. And it was through that son that God would continue to bless Abraham's family, and not just his family, but all the nations of the earth. God is a provider. As the story of the Bible progresses, he provides, he creates, he provides, but then we see he is also a savior. The family of Abraham eventually moves down into the land of Egypt. They start with around 70 people. But God blesses the family of Jacob. And after a few generations, they are so numerous that the Egyptians begin to worry that they are going to overtake the land. So they decide to make them slaves. They cause them to serve and to work under hard bondage. And it's under this oppression that the children of Israel, the Hebrews, they cry out to God. And in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen this affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Notice how active God is in this. He says, I have surely seen. I know their sufferings. I have come down to help them. God uses Moses to accomplish these things. But even though Moses is the, the vessel through which God is working, God is ultimately the, the main actor in all of this. God brings the plagues upon, upon the land. God causes the firstborn of Egypt to die. God parts the waters of the Red Sea. God brings his people out of bondage. He is their savior. And he brings about a great deliverance. The story of the Bible is all about God. As his people eventually make their way into the promised land, after a few hundred years, God establishes the nation. They have kings ruling over them. And he brings to the throne a man after his own heart. In the life of David, we see that the Lord is a defender. In Psalm chapter 18 and verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my, rock, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. David writes about how God is his source of protection, his rock, his deliverer, his defender. David had a number of ups and downs throughout his life. But through it all, God was always there with him, helping him, supporting him. When he faced his first great test against the giant Goliath, he didn't turn away or back down, but he knew that God would allow him to overcome. When Saul pursued him and tried to take his life, David was kept safe. He avoided his, his enemy's attempts to take his life. 
And when David is finally established on his throne, he captures the city of Jerusalem. He's in Zion and he says in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 10, And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. We read about all the things that David did, and sometimes we lose sight of the one who is behind all of those blessings. The story of the Bible is all about God. But that story is not just the things that God does. It's also a story about man. And how man responds to the Lord. We see that from the very beginning, the story of the Bible is a story about sin. Every person who has lived on this earth from the time of Adam and Eve, save for one, has fallen prey into the pit of sin. Sin is to transgress, to go beyond. It is to do something against what God has said. We see in Genesis 3, the very first sin after the creation was a sin of pride. God had told the man and the woman not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But after being tempted with the thought, the proposition that she could become like God, that she could have the knowledge of God, Eve takes from the tree and eats. She gives it to her husband and they are both changed in that moment. They They took the path that seemed best to them. They allowed their pride and their desire for power to overtake them that path that they choose ultimately takes them out of the garden as Evan talked about in his invitation on Wednesday night into a world of thorns and pain and ultimately death and we see it's not just Adam and Eve the story continues their sons Cain and Abel are born they grow up And come to bring an offering to the Lord. Abel's offering is accepted. Cain's is rejected. Cain is filled with anger and jealousy. He rises up to take his brother's life. The rest of the Bible story shows again and again how men and women fail to live up to that image that they were created in. Justin mentioned in his lesson last week that the Bible doesn't gloss over the sins, the mistakes, the failures of its main characters, but rather they are on full display. We see that in the life of Abraham. Right after God calls him to go to a new land, we find him in Genesis 12 acting with deceit. He goes down to Egypt, and instead of trusting that God will protect him, he lies about Sarah being his sister. He tries to solve the problem himself, come up with a solution that he thinks will work. And he says something that's not true. This wasn't just a one-time occurrence for Abraham. We see in Genesis chapter 20 that, again, he lies to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines. He says the same thing. She is my sister. Although this man has been chosen by God to receive his blessings and promises, we still find him falling into the trap of sin. Abraham lies about Sarah. Sarah is given a promise about having a son, and she laughs at the thought of bearing a child in her old age. When confronted about that, she says, no, I didn't laugh. 
deception, lying, and deceit are a theme in the family of Abraham. Again and again, it comes up. We see that sin is ever present in the lives of God's people. We come to the children of Israel, we see them complaining against God. Although God has rescued them from their slavery, He has, he has been their Savior to bring them out of bondage. When they come into the wilderness, they begin to complain. They long for the days when they were in Egypt, when they didn't have to eat this worthless bread that God has set before them. When Moses goes up onto the mountain to receive the commandments, they ask, where is this Moses? They begin to complain to Aaron, give us gods that we can see, that we can touch and feel, that we can decide how we will serve them. They begin to bow down to the golden calf. As we move forward into the time of the kings, we find David, the great king of Israel, established on his throne. All of his enemies have been put under subjection. And one night when he is walking on the roof of his palace, he is overcome by lust. In that moment when he sees Bathsheba, everything for David changes. His sin leads him down a path of adultery, betrayal, and ultimately murder. For a man who had trusted God to be his defender in the heat of battle, and yet now he has given the enemies of God great reason to blaspheme. And it all started with a look of lust. You see, the Bible is a story that is about sin. It's a part of every person's story, including yours and mine. Sin is a terrible thing. It comes in different forms and it has different consequences. But no matter what type of sin is done, there is always damage that occurs even if it is not noticeable or easily seen. We took the car into the shop one time. We had heard a sound up towards the front of the dashboard, and we thought we should get it checked out. And when the mechanic looked at it, from the outside, there was nothing wrong with the exterior. It was still driving. We were able to get it to the shop. But when he got up underneath the vehicle, he found that one of the pipes had been almost completely crushed in. The muffler had been smashed. And he asked us, he said, did you run over some large object? Did you go over the curb? We couldn't remember anything. And I said, well, is that going to be a problem for us? And he said, when the pipes get crimped like that, it starts to choke off the air that's going in to the engine. Eventually, it will burn up your, your car. And that's what sin does to us. It slowly starts to choke off our connection to God. Even if no one else around us sees it or notices or knows that it's there, if left untreated, it can eventually separate us from our connection and relationship with God. The Bible is a story about sin, but that's not the ending. If it was, that would be a very depressing and sad story. But we see that the Bible is a story about the cross. The cross is where God and man come together again. The cross depicts the terrible and devastating effects of sin in the death of God's only son. But it also shows us his incredible grace and love and mercy in what he was willing to do in forgiving man of his sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin 
for us. The cross teaches us that there's no sin that is too big for God. There's no sin that His love and His power cannot overcome. The cross is a sign to the whole world that God is willing to accept anyone who is willing to receive His grace. The cross reminds us that God is not giving up on us. God is not going to turn His back away from us. I've been coaching my kids in sports. And they're still learning how to play the game. What do you think happens when the ball bounces off of their foot and goes out of bounds? When they take a shot and it doesn't go in, when they pass the ball and it goes to the wrong team, do I stand up, go to my car, and drive back to my house? No, I'm there the whole time, encouraging, supporting, correcting, lifting up. You see, God doesn't turn away from us and leave us in our moments of weakness and stumbling. But he continues to stand by to help, to encourage, to support, even when we feel like there's no hope. We're not here today because of the absence of sin in our lives. We're here because we acknowledge our sin and we ask God to forgive us. And he is the only one that can provide us with the strength, the resolve, the determination to overcome. To aim higher in our pursuit, to be image bearers, to be like him. This, the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame bore the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. We're going to close this morning with a song of invitation. If you're not one of God's children this morning, we want to invite you to use this opportunity to confess your sins before God, to repent and be baptized, be washed in water, to have all of your sins washed away by the blood that Jesus was willing to give on the cross. If we can help you do that this morning, please come down to the front as together we stand and sing.